you wrote a 2013 NBER piece that raised a lot of the issues that we're talking about this morning. And recently, you led a commission sponsored by the Center for American Progress on Inclusive Prosperity, the goal of the commission being to address rising levels of income inequality and stagnant wages at the middle and bottom of the distribution. So in, the, in your thoughts and views on all of this, what do you see as the long run implications for the macro economy? Thanks, Melissa, and thanks uh, for the chance to be here. I'll leave the question of what we should do uh, till later. And so let me focus on uh, diagnosis and make a confession of ignorance, an observation, and express a worry. The confession of ignorance is this, and I think it should apply to everybody who speaks confidently in this uh, area. On the one hand, we have enormous anecdotal evidence and sort of visual evidence of the kind that Eric marshals that points to technology having huge and pervasive effects. Whether it is complementing workers and making them much more productive in a happy way, that's one possibility. Whether it is substituting for them and leaving them unemployed is another possibility that can be debated. But in either of those scenarios, you would expect it to be producing a renaissance of higher productivity. And so we, on the one hand, are convinced of the pervasiveness and far greater pervasiveness of technology in the last few years. And on the other hand, the productivity statistics for the last half dozen years are dismal. And any fully satisfactory synthetic view has to reconcile those two observations. And I have not heard them satisfactorily reconciled, which leads me to think that we don't have this uh, all figured out. But it is a big problem to believe. And by the way, if you believe that technology happens with a big lag, and it's only going to happen in the future, that's fine. But then you can't believe it's already caused a large amount of inequality uh, and disruption of employment today. So that is a major puzzle, which I think hangs over this subject, which I just want to put out there for discussion. Second observation, I think it is a mistake to think of the economy as homogeneous producing something called output as we approach uh, these uh, issues. And there's an aspect that doesn't get enough attention, which is sectors through progress working themselves into irrelevance. Let me give an example. The illumination sector, providing light. It actually has had about a tenfold increase in productivity every decade for a century. And we now think of it as a trivial sector in the economy. No doubt we could continue to produce tenfold increases in productivity, but actually most of us want it to be dark at night. And so, in fact, Little League, there are more Little League night games than there used to be. Parking lots are lit more brightly than they used to be. But basically what's happened is that illumination has become quasi-free. And whereas candle making was a major industry in the 1900s, illumination is a trivial industry today. And we need to recognize that, when, that a sector that has rapid technological progress but the world can absorb only so much of it, becomes ultimately unimportant uh, in the economy. Is that kind of thing relevant in thinking about the world? Here's a fact that continues to astonish me, and I concede that there are a million measurement problems around it. But it is a fact what I'm going to say. In the way they compute the consumer price indices, by definition, they were all set to be 100 for every good in 1983. Consider two goods today, a television set and a year at a university. And instead of using a year at a university, I could use a day in a hospital. <laughs> the consumer price index for the latter two categories is in the neighborhood of 600. The consumer price index for the former category 
is six. So there has been a hundredfold change in the relative price of TV sets and the provision of basic education and health care services. If anybody's wondering why governments can't afford to do the things they used to do, I just gave you a big hint. If anybody's wondering where most people are going to be working in the future, I just gave you a big hint. If, everybody's complete, if anybody's completely confident that we're going to have rapid productivity growth in the future, they should be given pause. Because no matter how fast we productivity we have in agriculture or illumination, it doesn't really matter for the aggregate economy. And increasingly, that's becoming true of a larger and larger fraction of uh, what it is that we produce. Third, I was, uh, when I was a undergraduate at MIT in the 1960s, there was a whole round of concern about this. Will automation displace all the employment? And what I was taught as an undergraduate was that basically the people who thought it would were a bunch of idiot Luddites. And that obviously there'd eventually be enough demand and it would all sort of work itself out. And if people got more productive, they'd be richer and they'd spend and maybe we needed some transition assistance. But that it was all basically going to be OK. That was what I was taught. That's what Bob Solo thought. He was a hero. And the other people were all a bunch of goofballs. It was, was kind of what I learned. And I actually believed that for many years and actually repeated it um, often. It has occurred to me that when I was being taught that, about 6% of the men in the United States between the age of 25 and 54 were not working. And that today, 16% of the men in the United States between the age of 25 and 54 are not working. And it won't be very different even when the economy is at full employment um, by any definition. And so something very serious has happened with respect to the general availability of quality jobs uh, in our society. And we can debate whether it's due to technology or whether it is not due to technology. We cannot debate. We can debate whether it's the cause of dependence or whether it is caused by policies that promote uh, dependence. But I think it is very hard to believe that a society in which the fraction of people in choose whatever your most prime demographic group is that should be working, whatever that group is, a society in which the fraction of them who are not working is doubling in a generation and seems to be on an upwards trend is going to be a society that is going to function well or at least function well without major social innovations. And I would want to leave you with that concern as there, whether you think it's due to technology or whether you think it's due to globalization or whether you think it's due to the maldistribution of political power, something very serious is happening in our society. Great, thank you. So I definitely want to make sure we return explicitly to the, to the questions that Larry's raised about policy and where we need to push. But before I do, I want to pick up on um, the first observation Larry made. And Eric, this is a great point for you to jump in on, which is you know, given all of these technological advances, uh, really celebrated. Why is it that GDP per capita isn't rising more rapidly? You know, why, why is it that median wages are essentially flat? And in particular, what does that imply about the impact technology is having on our living standards? Are we just, we're not seeing it in the numbers. Are we not measuring it appropriately? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's good for uh, Larry to bring up, and it's part of what spurred Andy and I to sort of start working in this stream in the beginning. People like Bob Gordon and Tyler Cowen and others talked about a great stagnation, and at the same time we were seeing these amazing things. Andy touched on a few of them. There, you know, we, there's a lot more we could, I could spend days talking about the, the, the wonders of technology we've seen. So it is a bit of a, 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 
paradox there. Um, there are a couple parts of it, though, that, that are worth kind of decomposing. The part about median income, I, I don't see that being such a, a paradox. Uh, I think that, as I suggested earlier, there's no economic law that says everybody is going to evenly benefit. It could be some small group is left behind. It could be, unfortunately, a, a big group, 50, you know. And, and so you can have biased technical change that, that grows the pie, but some people are made worse off. And I think that's a fair description, to, at least in my mind. I, mean, I know other people would disagree about uh, a big part of the story of, of what's going on is that people with certain types of skills are in much less demand than they were in the past, in part because of technology. And many of them are in the median income. And, and David's been one of the people who's documented this, but lots of people have touched on it. The question of, of overall um, GDP per capita is, is, is more uh, puzzling. Although, as I showed you the chart, I don't, you don't see as much of a problem in that great decoupling chart there as you do with the median. I mean, I think that big part of the angst, you know, that the, whether it's the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, and other people feel is that median line, not the, not the top line. But even there, it maybe hasn't been quite as, as robust as, as maybe some of us would have expected. No, in it should have been. If technology has been super and more strong and more potent and more everything than it should have been before. The question isn't whether it's slowed down. The question is why didn't these new gale forces of yeah. technology so, lead to a big acceleration? That's what so, you would so have let me, let me let me address that. Um, so I've spent a lot of time visiting companies that are installing these, these technologies. And um, some of them are actually quite complicated. So you install, say, an ERP system or a customer relationship management system. I mean, we documented it takes five to seven years for them to roll out. And during that process, there's a huge amount of organizational disruption. And you can do this at, on a case-by-case -case basis. There's lots of case studies of disasters, including at MIT and elsewhere, trying to roll these things out. Uh, quite disruptive in the, in, as they're being rolled out. No productivity gain or even a decrease while they're being rolled out. And we, got, we have aggregate data from large, hundreds of these firms that we've, you know, I've written some papers on this that show that there's a, a long lag. If you roll that up to an entire supply chain or an entire economy, you can imagine that, that these organizational disruptions, these organizational complements, which are often about 10 times larger than the technology investments themselves, um, and, and they take much longer to roll out, can be part of these, these both enormous disruption, but also um, until the complementary pieces are in place, you don't get the full productivity benefits. People like Paul David have documented that when you go back to electricity, it took 30 years um, for n significant productivity gains. So I think that may be part of the story, that we're in the midst of a big organization, reorganization of the economy. Yes, that is disruptive. Yes, people see that these people have to be laid off, and these other people have to be hired, and these other people have to be reskilled. And as you're doing that, um, you don't instantly get the full productivity gain, but you do get a lot of the disruption. So then you can, that can, I think, partly answer Larry's question about how you could have disruption without getting the full payoff. If, I, I would also just like to take a moment to touch on some of the things that, that, that David brought up, because I think those are also very interesting. I mean, partly about the, you know, the, the leveling off of skill bias technical change, I, you know, I, I, or the college premium, I should say, is actually very consistent with what we see changes in the technology that are now, are, as I showed, addressing different parts of, of the labor market. And more broadly, I think he raises the right question about complements and substitutes and, and what's happening. And if you look, oftentimes technologies initially are broadly complementary, as, as many pieces of the system uh, require humans or other uh, to fill in. I mean, if you look at horses, the number of horses increased all through the uh, Industrial Revolution up to about 1901. That was peak horse. And uh, because, yeah. you know, whether it's saddles or carriages or other things, you know, made horses much more valuable. But then the numbers plummeted um, once um, the, the remaining component that horses added wasn't so, wasn't, was no longer not automatable, if that's not too many double negatives. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you could see similar things uh, potentially, you know, um, are humans different than horses? Of course, we're different in many, many ways. We have a much broader skill set. We can, you know, think a lot better mostly. And, um, and, and horses don't own capital. And, and also, um, once labor starts disappearing, you can, you can have humans own capital, or at least some of them. Um, humans can vote. <laughs> humans can have guns and, and do other things that, that if they're not happy with the income distribution. So there's a lot of other things that are potentially different. But as an economic you know, fact, I, I don't think that there's any necessary um, 
uh, inevitability, as Larry was saying, that, that, that what people thought in maybe the 60s, that, that don't worry, it automatically self takes, takes care of itself. And that's one of the reasons I think we should have this discussion is to figure out what are the policies to address it. And even in the first industrial revolution, there's a lot of policy changes that help us navigate that in a way that we did create shared prosperity or in inclusive prosperity. Larry, do you want to jump in? Just on, the, just on the productivity and disruption thing, I think, it is a, I think it's a difficult argument. So let's take retailing. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine you're going to have all kinds of spiffy technology, so you're no longer going to have to have people behind cash registers and all that. The problem is you wouldn't kind of expect that the people behind the cash registers would get fired before the people working the systems got the new systems working. And so the challenge about right now is people see that there's a lot of disemployment that's already come from the technology, but they don't see any productivity increase. Mm -hmm. And I understand why it might take years for it all to have an effect. What I have a harder time understanding is how there can be substantial disemployment ahead of the effect of the productivity. That is, if you thought that if you thought that it just was impossible to put in these systems and, and, uh, and so forth, then you might think that in the short run, it would be a big employment boon because you'd have to keep your old system going, you have to keep your legacy system going, and you'd have to have a million guys running around figure, figuring out how to put the new computer system in. So I understand low productivity, but I think it is hard to square, and, and I, it's not like I have the answer to this puzzle, but it, it, if you think about it hard, I don't think it's easy to square low productivity and substantial disemployment. And I don't think the, the lags to reorganization story quite does it because you shouldn't be getting the disemployment ahead of the productivity. Well, I, it is a complicated story, and I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think I've totally nailed it yet, but I think another part of the puzzle is that there are a lot of rents in the economy as well, and if you get a, a, the types of people who do the reorganization being very different than the type of people whose demand is falling, you can have some big changes in, in where the rents are happening way ahead of the changes in the overall output. So, so let's, let's deal with the fact that there, there is disemployment and mm -hmm. decreasing labor force participation right. rates. The bottom line is there is that, that part I think we agree. That right, the, the, we agree the on that are, and, and are, we all agree we don't want to go happening. the way of the horse. So what do we do about <laughs> this? Okay, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to talk about policy and I'm going to pose this to the panelists as a two-part question, so bear with me. So first, it seems to me that in large part the way this is going to play out for the American worker is going to depend on how labor supply responds, in particular in terms of skills. In other words, will, will, is there a way to imagine that a sufficient number of people in our population will acquire the skills or the, the talents that are needed to economically prosper in the second machine age? Um, and what would it take? Is our, is our education system broadly defined up to the task of delivering those skills and talents? And the second part of my question is, what about those workers who simply can't acquire those skills or, or don't possess those talents? Um, or even the ones who do, but there simply aren't enough high paying jobs for everyone. So, so I will admit that a, you know, I am in part worried about a scenario where a small share of the population commands increasingly high wages and a larger share is relegated to low-paying service jobs, presumably providing services to the high-wage folk. Like, it doesn't make me feel much better that robots are not going to be able to give a good manicure or <laughs> clean houses anytime soon. So, you know, this, is that a reasonable thing to worry about? And if so, don't we need to really rethink our social contract and dramatically expand our system of wage subsidies and income support? May I, uh, I might want to take a stab at this, starting with the premise that if we applied the same capabilities that we've said may have a positive or negative effect, but to uh, unleash them in this particular question of how efficiently are the skills being communicated by employers, the training programs communicating what you'll get if you join, and what the job seeker has or might wish to get, 
to me, we're like in the dark ages of, of the quality of that experience. You, you log on to Amazon.com and there's you know, feedback loops that they've been analyzing to know what's the probability I'm there to shop for a video or for uh, lawn equipment or whatever. And if you ask the same question of the workforce, uh, the sad answer to that is drastically uh, no. I, I, we just did a study on the unemployed uh, veterans skills gap. And what we tried to do is we, we read every job posting in the economy and said, what are the underlying skills associated with the job postings? And we then looked at, uh, as best we could through open government data, the underlying skills of unemployed veterans. And we took a spotlight on the, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And you had you know, hundreds of uh, technology companies post jobs from employers who made a commitment to hire veterans. And they, they're going out of their way to want to hire veterans. And they, uh, but they communicate the job in such a manner that feels like it's not really available or attainable to some, some um, set of the population. So by doing this sort of skills assessment, what we figured out was every single entry-level technology job, every single one in April of 2014, from an employer who made a veteran hiring commitment, could have been filled by a tech-trainable vet who was at that moment in time unemployed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yet neither the employer knew to look for that tech trainable vet whose background may not have made the initial screen when they did the screening, nor did the vet know that they could get that tech job because it was not in their like suggested career path. There was no recommendations engine to say, this is a very simple and attainable opportunity to get you to the next stage. So if there's that level of inefficiency in information sharing about just basic matching of talent, opportunity. I mean, every one of these New York Times stories, how many young people have the skills to get into a Harvard or an MIT in minority communities don't even apply because they didn't even think they could get in or know that financial aid's available. So we're making bad decisions in our economy. So if we unleashed recommendations engines, the same that the gentleman that talked about the Go game or whatever, if the same capability could advise, if every person in the economy had a little helper that said, given who you are and where you want to be, Here's the shortest path to awesomeness based on the limited uh, additional skill you need to attain to land the best job that's available to you. Is that anywhere near in our system today? How exciting would it be if, that, if, if, if there was an uh, unleashed marketplace of tools to do just that? Would we solve this before you get into the income subsidy question? Just make the system work better. I think that's an initial place to start. And, and where is the vet going to get those skills? From the employer, from the local community college, from Udacity? So this is the other fascinating question. Uh, we did a little panel uh, uh, at the Center for American Progress highlighting this uh, uh, AT&T partnership with Udacity for nano degrees. These are six-month uh, chunks of learning. Uh, here's the irony of it. Uh, they're great for cybersecurity and other sort of entry, you know, interesting areas of growth. So I asked the question, are any of you regulated as learning programs that qualify for government subsidy, whether they be Title IV funding or qualify for the GI Bill benefit, or qualify for Workforce Investment Board you know, vouchers. And the sh sad reality is these innovations are disconnected from any actual government support because there aren't thoughtful regulatory on-ramps for these new entrants to be uh, reimbursed in that manner. So these are the areas where I think there's opportunity. Want to jump in? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with the direction you're going in terms of, of skilling. And I, I think there's a, you know, there's a policy focus on sort of college for all and you know, that has been healthy at some level, but it's, uh, it's, it's very incomplete. Uh, our education system is geared towards get people out of high school and into college. If they don't go to college, we sort of, well, it didn't work out. And uh, that's not productive when uh, less than half of young adults are going to complete a four-year degree. Uh, and that's not going to you know, be 75% within 10 years or even within 30 years in all likelihood, although there has been an increase in both high school graduations and college completions over the last 10 years. Um, I think we need to think about the skill sets that allow people to do uh, evolving jobs in uh, uh, healthcare, right? Uh, para health, healthcare professionals in technical positions, many of which require real skill sets, uh, but they don't require four-year liberal arts training. And so I think we we push too many people towards expensive uh, four-year degrees, which m either are not as efficient as they could be or not as appealing as they could be, there are opportunities in kind of, and this is something Harry Holzer has written on a lot, on kind of 
uh, the sort of new middle skill occupations. They aren't things that you can just get with a high school degree. A high school degree is foundational. It's a credential, but it's credential for further vocational training. I think there's a lot of productive room for investment there. Hopefully, technology will allow us to be better at that. Uh, unclear. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, we're, we stare, in, as with so many things, there's great potential and great uncertainty about how fast and how well it will work. Um, my biggest concern in all this is the sort of uh, the inequality with which people have responded to these market signals. So you might have thought in a time when college was becoming more valuable and more and more people were going to college that sort of the gradient between household income and college going would get shallower because everybody would take it. And that has not occurred. Uh, the gradient in college going has become much more, much steeper in family income, and in college completion, much steeper still. And so I, I think that that works against economic mobility. It means that kids from uh, low SES backgrounds are much less likely uh, to be going to school and to be gainfully employed. And so, you know, when, when Larry talks about the declining employment rate among uh, US workers, we're, we're primarily talking about uh, young males. Uh, many of them minorities, many of them from poor families. And so it's, it's a pretty concentrated problem, uh, which makes it worse, not better. Uh, it's, you know, if you sort of look from the median on up, you know, US society looks mobile, it looks healthy, it looks like it's making the right investments. Uh, if you look from, the, you know, below the median, uh, they're just, that message and the tools to make, to correct that problem are, are somehow uh, not coming together. There you go. Let me say, let me, let me say a few things, and I'm actually more confident about these than I am about the technology stuff, given the, product, given the productivity question. First, uh, with great respect, and I would engage in the experiments. I think the policies that Anish is talking about are largely whistling past the graveyard. The core problem is that there aren't enough jobs. And if you help some people, you can help them get the jobs, but then someone else won't get the jobs. And unless you're doing things that are affecting the demand for jobs, you're helping people win a race to get a finite number of jobs, and there are only so many of them. This was very powerfully demonstrated by a study done by Esther Duflo in France, where they looked at a variety of these kinds of job matching innovations, and they basically found that in the low unemployment areas of France, they worked. And in the high unemployment areas of France, they only helped some people at the expense of other people with no net impact. Folks, wage inflation in the United States is 2%. It has not gone up in five years. There are not 3% of the economy where there's any evidence of hyper wage inflation of the kind that would go with worker shortages. The idea that you can just have better training and then there are all these jobs, all these places where there are these huge shortages and we just need to train people is an evasion of uh, the problem. I'm all for trying to do it, but it is fundamentally an evasion. Second, what we need is more demand. And that goes to short-run cyclical policy. It goes more generally to the way we operate macroeconomic policy and the enormous importance of having tighter markets so that firms have an incentive to reach for workers rather than workers having an incentive to reach for firms. It's quite remarkable to look at, over the years at the Harvard Economics Department. When there are 30 professors and 40 graduate students, it's remarkable how badly the graduate students get treated. When there are 30 professors, and 20 graduate students, and every professor wants a graduate student, it's remarkable how well the graduate students get treated. <laughs> and that process, you know, people who've been to school in environments where there's 60% men or where there's 60% women are not unfamiliar with this uh, phenomenon. Having the labor market run tight is fundamentally important for fairness. It is fundamentally important for uh, generating uh, investment in workers. Third thing I would say is that I, and this is in the same direction as what uh, David uh, was saying, and I agree with him, and he knows much more about it uh, than I. I think we can't think of education as just an undifferentiated blob of human capital where more is good. The idea used to be, kind of, kind of the way I would have sort of thought about this um, uh, 30 years ago, 
was that part of what would be good about having more education is that people would be able to work in an office rather than being plumbers. And that was part of what was good, that, that, that would upgrade people and give them new opportunity, and plumbers' children could work, in, uh, could work in offices rather than being plumbers. It's kind of the essence of the technological changes that are being described, that they are much more heavily bearing on uh, people who work in offices than they are on plumbers. And so the whole idea of working with a craft and a specialized uh, skill rather than this generic general manager with liberal arts competence is, I think, central uh, to, uh, to thinking uh, in a rational way about uh, wages. And if I could just say one other thing, I think that the broad empowerment of labor in a world where an increasing share of, increasing part of the economy is generating income that has a kind of rent aspect to it, and the question of who's going to share in it becomes very large. One of the lesser puzzles, but very large puzzle of our economy today, is that on the one hand, we have record low real interest rates that are expected to be record low for 30 years if you look at the index bond market. And on the other hand, we have record high profits. And you would tend to think record high profits would mean record high returns to capital, would mean really high re real interest rates. And what we actually have is really low real interest rates. And probably the right way to think about that is that there's a lot of rents in what we're calling profits that don't really represent a return to investment, but represent a rent. And the question of who's going to get those rents, which goes to the minimum wage, goes to the power of unions, goes to the presence of profit sharing, goes to the length of patents and a variety of other government policies that confer rents, and then when those rents are received, goes to the question of how progressive the tax and transfer system is, that has got to be a very, very large part of the picture. And I am concerned that if we allow the idea to take hold, that all we need to do is there are all these jobs with skills, and if we just can train people a bit, then they'll be able to get into them and the whole problem will go away. I think that is fundamentally an evasion of a profound social challenge. So let me ask you, though, you, you raised the issue of the minimum wage and unions and the bargaining power of, of workers. But it strikes me that we're faced with a conundrum in the sense that you know, these, these technological changes we've been talking about make the imperative of giving workers more sort of you know, bargaining power and a, and a higher minimum wage make them make that more compelling and important. But at the same time, those same technologies make it easier for employers to replace workers who become too expensive with machines. So how, how do we thread that needle? Well, I think that is a, a real challenge. And one of the ways I think a lot of us have talked about is things, not just the minimum wage, but things like the earned income tax credit, which is a way of uh, encouraging people to work and sharing some of the, the benefits from the economy to people who are, are working and, and maybe not making very high wages. That's through the tax code, not That's, the employer-employee yeah, relationship. And, and, and the, one of the differences is that while it increases the incentive for people to be working and, and rewards and, and helps with income distribution, it's a broadly shared cost that lots of people bear as opposed to specifically the employer who comes up with a way of employing that person. Um, and it, it I think that you can make a good argument that those em employers, those entrepreneurs who figure out how to put some of those people to work should not be the only ones that bear the burden of having to, to uh, raise the incomes of the people who are, are right now having their skill demands fall. So an income tax credit is a way of, of sharing that more broadly. And, so, and the net effect is not only encouraging more people to work, but also there's a spillover. It, it could actually encourage more people to look for creating those kinds of jobs. Yeah, let's Let's just have some numbers here, just to put this in, put this in perspective. Mm -hmm. Roughly speaking, if we had the same income distribution in the United States that we did in 1979, the top 
would have one trillion dollars less today, and the bottom 80 percent would have one trillion dollars more. And that works out to about $700,000 a family for the top 1 percent, works out to about $11,000 a, a year for a family in the bottom 80 percent. But it's a trillion dollars. I don't know what the number is. My guess is that the total cost of the earned income tax credit is $50 billion. Nobody's got on the policy agenda doubling the earned income tax credit. And the big aggressive agendas for the earned income tax credit are probably to increase it by a third or a half. So we're talking about, so I'm for it. I'm all for it. But we are talking about two and a half percent of the redistribution uh, that has taken place. And so you have to be looking for things, and there's no one thing uh, that is uh, going to do it. My reading of the evidence, and I, I think it's a fairly general uh, reading of the evidence, is that while there may be some elasticity, the elasticity around the current level of the minimum wage is uh, very low. Uh, perhaps a good way to make that point is to observe that the real minimum wage in the United States today is about 20 percent below where it was when Ronald Reagan was president. And even Ronald Reagan, when he was president, wasn't really complaining that the then existent minimum wage was doing a lot of damage to employment. And productivity has gone, uh, productivity has gone up uh, since that time. It's tempting to think that everything's tradable. But, you know, if you ask not between, across international borders between the United States and other countries, if you just take the Boston SMSA and you say how much of, G, how much of the Boston SMSA's GDP is tradable, it's less than half. And so there's a lot of scope for raising wages in areas where there isn't going to be some broad uh, kinds of competition. Good. So we have some questions from the audience, and I'm going to ask one that relates directly to that last point. So the question is, what is the role of trade on technology and vice versa? How does this relate to the relative skills of people in different countries? That's a great one. Actually, this is, this is one I wanted to bring up. Uh, you know, a lot of the disruption that people attribute to technological change over the last 15, 20 years actually has had a great deal to do with changes in international trade. And uh, the, you know, especially the uh, accession of China to the WTO in 2001, to everybody's surprise, led to an, an enormous surge in uh, imports in the U.S. and a very sharp decline. Manufacturing employment has had very large spillovers to uh, surrounding communities and the work that I've done with uh, David Dorn and Gordon Hansen uh, and Daron Asimoglu and Brendan Price really documents that I think it's, we've all been surprised by how big a factor that is. And uh, fortunately, that, you know, we're much closer to equilibrium now. Policy aside, the next 20 years are not going to look anything like the present. But I think this kind of disruptive uh, power is, uh, is underappreciated and it's been quite significant. Um, so that doesn't have an that doesn't have a, I, I am actually in favor of the president receiving fast track authority for uh, negotiating trade agreements and so on. But I, I do think that we, we often, you know, we find an effect and we look for a cause and sometimes we get it wrong. We, t we want to attribute it to the most obvious thing uh, rather than uh, the, the something more subtle. You know, we thought inter the internet uh, economy was an amazing thing from about 1995 to 1999. I don't see how it all of a sudden became a disastrous thing around 2000. I just don't think that's plausible. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the other thing I would say is I, I do think that we're, you know, that trade does circumscribe, or the possibility of trade, some of the things we can do. We, we could not, in my opinion, restore unions to where they were 40 years ago without having very substantial competitive effects uh, because uh, we uh, face we don't have the kind of rents, the kind of market power. And you know, you can point to countries like Germany that have you know, much stronger unionization, but then German companies are outsourcing a lot of their employment to Eastern Europe. Um, so I think that that is a real constraint. On the other hand, I also want to point out that we bring a very sort of Western-centric perspective of this. Globalization and the technology jointly have you know, brought more human beings out of poverty in the last 20 years, in any time in world history, and that's not just because we have a larger population. I mean, as a percentage, right? If we look at what's happened in China, we look at what's happened in India, and a lot of the things that we view as threatening 
uh, are creating much broader prosperity. At the same time, they create greater concern. When I think about machine substituting labor, I worry much more about Indian textile workers uh, than I do about the general employment patterns in the US. So I think that if, if, that if I'm thinking about this kind of technological dystopia, I think about a world where you know, poor people in Kenya have you know, solar cells, but uh, they don't have any, there's no job for, for which their skills are really scarce. Um, so I, but I think that we should be thinking about technology and globalization as working hand in hand at this point. And the view in the 1980s, early 90s, that trade was sort of irrelevant to what it was happening in the US is, I think is, is quite out of date and still has not fully permeated the consciousness of, of how people have thought about the developments the last 20 years. I, I want to agree in part and disagree uh, in, in part. I think first, it's right to say that trade and technology, in a sense, uh, are strongly associated with each other. We wouldn't have much more trade but for uh, the much greater ease of communicating and transporting across countries, but for the technology that represented uh, the container ship and a great deal else. So what we call trade and the great increases in trade are very much tied up with technology. It's the first thing I'd say. Second, I would agree and be, but be inclined respectfully to disagree with David on one aspect. I agree with David, and certainly my thinking would have evolved over the last 20 years, on the question of how much has changing trade patterns impacted the US labor market. I think there is pretty clear evidence that there have been significant impacts. I think some people exaggerate them, but I think there have been significant impacts. I think it is a quite different statement to assert that all of that is due to trade agreements. And I think one has to look carefully, for example, at the counterfactual. David asserted that uh, since China's accession into the WTO, well, what is the counterfactual? Uh, I have some familiarity with the level of US tariffs on China prior to China's accession into the WTO, and they were not high. And so a very subs the main reason why China is exporting more to the United States is that China is producing six times as much as it was in 1999 and producing in much more technologically sophisticated uh, ways. Now, it's true that if they had not been in the WTO, conceivably we could have passed a whole new set of protectionist measures. But I think if you ask the question, if the United States had maintained its trade policies vis-a-vis -vis China as they stood before China was admitted into the WTO, what fraction of the increase in Chinese exports to the United States would we have observed? I think the answer is the vast majority of that increase in exports. And I think that's very important because I think there's a tendency to suppose that if trade developments impact the wage distribution importantly in the United States, then presumptively trade agreements are a bad idea. And I think that in order to analyze any given trade agreement, one has to ask the question, how much are barriers being changed in the United States? And how much are barriers being changed in the affected country? And my reading of the evidence is that in many of the cases, because rightly or wrongly, the United States market is already substantially open. If you look at the proposed trade agreements, the reduction in barriers and the consequent increase in exports to other countries looms quite large relative to any impact in the United States. And so I just think that's an important qualification on the globalization story. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask a different one that takes this, things in a bit of a different direction. So uh, someone asks, you know, from the end of the 19th century, technology let the work week decline. Why can't that process continue with the benefit of technology being a shorter work week with no loss of income? And I'm, I'm going to add uh, a bit of a maybe existential question or spin to this, which maybe is too <laughs> existential for an economic policy group, but still. So, you know, all of this technology really changes our view of the good life and how we think about our time. 
And Anisha's story about you know, the, the, the expert craft furniture makers who now put together ready to assemble products for IKEA, I mean, maybe this is too nostalgic for an economist, but something seems lost in that to me. I mean, Eric, I'm going to open this to you. I, this must be something you've thought a lot about. No, this, is, this, is a, this is a great question. And, and for those who haven't already read uh, Keynes's great article, uh, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, he talked about, made predictions about what would happen to our generation. Uh, he was more or less spot on in terms of GDP per capita. He extrapolated those exponential functions exactly right, and, and he got that right. And he inferred that he looked around people who were that wealthy in, in his area that people wouldn't want to work a lot. They'd maybe go, um, you know, fox hunting occasionally or whatever. Um, but there wasn't much else to do with that much wealth. And of course, that part he, he got very wrong. People are not working, he, he thought, 10 to 15 hours a week. Um, mostly those who are working are, are working a lot more than that. And there, there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, part of it is we have a lot more we can spend our money on now than we did back then. There's lots of new goods that, that people, I think, enjoy. Part of it also, and there's, this gets into sociology, I think a lot of people sort of, they enjoy working. There's a, um, a, uh, a meaning that it gives to life for a lot of people. Uh, Bob Putnam described what happened when work leaves a community, and, and it's really sad to see how all sorts of other social indicators just plummet because of the way we are wrapped up in, in having a job and having a work. And going forward, could we have shorter work weeks? Would that be part of it? I, I think certainly we could, and there's a somewhat of a, a trend in that direction, not as rapid as, as Keynes imagined. But we'd probably have to start thinking about new ways to get how we get meaning in life, and, and I don't think that that's an insurmountable uh, problem. We'd also have to continue to have enough productivity growth to make that work, but I also don't think that's insurmountable. If you look at it, I'm uncertain what I think about what I think about this. If you look at an introductory economics textbook from the 1960s or 1970s, in about chapter five, there's always a discussion of something called the backward bending labor supply curve. And the idea is that as your wages go up, at first you work more and more because it's attractive to work, and then after a while you have enough income. And then when you have enough income, you uh, take, take a bunch of it in leisure. And so the labor supply curve looks like this. If you look at an introductory economics textbook today, that idea is usually largely not there. And the reason is that it used to kind of be true that high wage people work less hours than low wage people. Your image of the 1930s was that the CEO sort of went out to play golf at 4 o'clock and the workers worked 60 hours a week. And if you look today, for the first time basically in economic history, people who have higher wages, on average, very consistently, are choosing to work more or are finding themselves working more hours than people who have low wages. And it's in part a matter, it's not all because the people who have low wages are, being, are not able to get more work. There is choices that people are working more hours. And that's why this idea of a more leisurely nirvana is, um, less in, is less in fashion. That said, I, I must say I have to be impressed that Americans work about 50% more hours, maybe 45% more hours in a year than Northern Europeans. And I'm not sure that I would want to call that a great virtue of uh, American uh, of American society, but I think we have to think um, very carefully about what the alternative to work is and how meaning and community are found uh, in the absence of work. Uh, classical economics has this simple view, which is working is bad, leisure is good. Um, those who spent time in communities with 28% unemployment, I don't think find that a riveting formulation <laughs> of human motivation and desire. And so I think it's something that needs to be uh, thought about a great deal. And I guess the, the thought I have without knowing where to go with it is it sure seems like in our society, whether it is uh, 
taking care of the young or taking care of the old or repairing a lot that needs to be repaired. There is a huge amount of very valuable work that needs to be done. It's much less clear, to use a modern phrase, that there's a viable business model for getting it done. And I guess the reason why I think there's going to need to be a lot of reflection on the role of government going forward is that if I'm right that there's vitally important work to be done for which there's no standard capital business model that will get it done, that suggests uh, important roles for public policy. I have to make a friendly uh, uh, extension of where Larry just ended, which is uh, there's actually some activist work in government to make it uh, with a business return on investment the social good. So, you know, addressing climate change feels like a big priority for all of us to do something about. And the fastest growing job in America is, if for uh, energy job, what's the fastest growing energy job in America? David. Solar panel installation. Solar panel installation. Now, you made earlier a comment about trade and technology. Partially, this is because the cost of importing uh, solar panels is low. Now, here's an interesting conundrum. If you benchmarked Germany against the US on the cost to install solar panel, in a, in a world where you've got globally competitive prices for importing these technologies, these fancy panels, what explains the delta? It's a little over a billion dollar delta uh, if you kind of ran it out. What explains it is something called the soft costs of solar installation. The lack of automation in something as simple as permitting the ability for a home or a business to put solar panels on the roofs. So if we took this powerful concept of information technology and innovation, and if we had ubiquitous same-day permitting processes and much more efficient uh, financial markets for credit uh, in order to finance these things, and we had much more uh, uh, readily available uh, matchmaking services so that folks who want the solar panels at a lower price can get them more rapidly with the local installers, if all of those technologies could be put to work that way, we would reduce this billion dollar hidden tax on the American solar panel economy, which is already the fastest growing uh, energy job in America. So you'd create more jobs on the backs of what is essentially a low cost uh, trade import. You would address issues important to the world, like climate change. You would, and what's getting in the way? The lack of the adoption of these innovation, uh, these capabilities in, of all places, the mayor's office or the government. Can you do same-day solar permitting in New York City? You cannot, but you can in certain parts of California where they're making an emphasis here. So my, my only comment about, uh, there's too much work to do to have the leisure question, but if you're going to do it and you're worried that there is, you know, as Larry said, there's work to be done, but there's no return, we can make it profitable. There should be many, many, many companies that are organizing labor to put solar panels in. If we could decost the process by applying these technologies, that would grow the market, create jobs, and not all of those installation jobs requires a PhD in physics, right? You can do them with different levels of skill in the economy. So I think there's a role of government to like create market opportunity in places where we need it. Well, we will be having another Hamilton Project event on March 11th, focused on removing frictions in the labor market with the goal of increasing jobs. So hopefully you'll all join us again for that. Um, but in the meantime, please join me in, in thanking our panelists. Okay, great.